And uh, in studio, I am joined by uh, Ashok Sani, and uh, he goes by uh, Master Taylor, Taylor Master, like he's good in this, whatever he does. He's good at whatever he does. And uh, as usual, they say that uh, style is more of, uh, uh, it's, it's more of elegance. It's what speaks out before you actually even speak when you enter in any room. Amani Very true, very true. Well said. Karibu sana. Thank you very much. Wow, I am so very happy to have this conversation with you. Me too. Sababu watu wanasema huku kwa streets, uh, suti zako ni nzuri. <laughs> na pia kwamba kwa bay pia tuangadie. <laughs> so can you introduce yourself? Okay, my name is Ashok Sani. Mm -hmm. I'm the master tailor and creative director at Ashok Sani Satorial. We do high-end bespoke and made to measure suits for both uh, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. So, uh, where did their passion start from, like you being a designer? Okay, uh, I started way back when I was still in, in campus. What I used to do, I used to go to Kikomba, get a few pieces, uh, uh, had them adjusted, and then wear them. So, as more, the more you wear uh, unique pieces, the more you get comments and you get friends. Actually, friends used to steal my clothes. Some mm -hmm. used to go with them, some used to buy them. So at the end of the day, when you come, as the more you learn, when you when you meet tailors, you come and learn that there's something called fabrics. Mm -hmm. Somewhere you can buy fabrics instead of buying a uh, mtumba um, outfit and then start resizing it, and then you don't get the product that you want. So you 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 get fabrics, make something out of that. Then that's how it started. Because I like to wear suits, but you could not find a suit. A suit was very expensive. Actually, in Nairobi, it's still very expensive to get a high-end mm -hmm. quality suit. And back in those days, you could only buy a suit from Sir Henry's or Little Red. Little Red is very, very expensive. You could not even walk in that street. Right. So you, you go to Sir Henry's. Sir Henry's also, you get, as a creative, you get limited colors options. You get black, navy, blue, the office. Because at the end of the day, they used to bring in things that could sell, not things that are fashionable. Yeah, they have the mindset of yeah. the setup. Yeah, so as a creative, you were limited by what you could find in the market. So at the end of the day, you, you end up doing finding ways to that you can bring out your creativity into the world. All right. Yeah. Okay, it's one thing to love to dress well. And, uh, you know, as you've spoken, it, it includes a lot when it comes yeah. to fabrics and yeah. everything else. So yeah. at what particular time did you actually uh, start designing your own clothes? The first time, actually, I went to a designer and I wanted to make a piece. So I gave this designer what I wanted to make. And uh, I gave them the amount of money they, they requested. So at the end of the day, I never got the outfit. So instead of back and forth and fighting, I told him, this is what you could do. Okay. You can do the business. I can do the business. All you need to do is you have a brand. You already have a brand in the market. Mm -hmm. Let me do the legwork. So that's how it started. So I started working for someone before I started doing my own brand. All right, yeah. all right, all right. So for how long have you been in the market doing this? It's almost eight years now, eight if years. I can remember. Yeah. Oh, that's a long yeah. time. Yeah. So uh, take us through, uh, what is your educational background? Tell us more about you, what did you study in school? And if one, if one desires to be a designer, what sort of background should they have? For me, actually, I never went to fashion school. I've never been to fashion school. Uh, what I did in campus was BBAT, my, my bachelor's in business information technology. Uh, when it comes to tailoring and stitching, I learned it as an apprenticeship. When I'm after classes, when I didn't have classes, I used to go somewhere, mm -hmm. learn it as an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. So if you, want, if you want to perfect your craft, mm -hmm. no matter how many years you go to school, you can never, something like, like tailoring where you, your skill is what, what sells you, you need to learn it and practice it as much as possible. So whichever background you come from, as long as you're passionate about something, even if it's tailoring, designing, it's, it's, it's marketing, whatever you want to do. As long as you're passionate in it and you have time to learn and you have the patience to learn, mm -hmm. you can perfect it. And it takes a long time. It doesn't, it doesn't take two to three years. It takes a long time to perfect your craft. Even me, where I'm here right now, I haven't perfected my craft. I'm still learning day by day. Mm -hmm. You learn new things day by day. You interact with people, you clients, you learn different things as you go on. All right. Yeah. So as you say that it takes time yeah. and I, I believe patience is it's a virtue right here. Yeah. All right, so who was your first client? How did you get through, break through, the, through the market? Because I believe that this is a space fashion industry. It's a space that uh, has been there for centuries, uh, right in Kenya. We have uh, a lot of fashion designer. So for you, how did you break into the market? Uh, 
the first clients I had actually were just friends and family. That's, that's the, the first people you test your product on. And then when, as it grows, because at that time it was very, very difficult. The fashion industry at that time was just a name. You didn't have a fashion industry. Fabrics that were being brought uh, by the suppliers were just normal fabrics. Most fabrics you could find are ladies' fabrics. So if you want to do men's, you're limited by the quality of fabrics that are available. So uh, the, f the first time I broke into the market was I got a gig doing uh, these beauty pageants. So I used to do choreography for models. So the first gig I got was doing outfits, choreography and outfits for models. So that's, that's, that's where I, I started doing fashion. But what I came to understand in Kenya, Kenyans don't, Kenyans celebrate designers, but they don't appreciate designers. Okay. So no matter how many fashion shows you do, you can, have a, you can have a name, but you can have a name, but the brand doesn't sell. That's the difference between... Where's the disconnect in that? The thing is, there's a, the market is very, very small in Kenya. The people who have purchasing power don't look at fashion designers. Mm -hmm. They'll just look for garments they can wear. People who look for fashion designers don't have the purchasing power. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the cost of production in Kenya is very high. That's why you see Louis, Gucci, the big designers, they don't produce in their own country, they produce in China for mass production because okay. the cost of production is lower. But then when they bring these things back to Italy or whichever distribution channels they have all over the world, the, the tariffs are very low. So they're encouraging them to sell in retail. In Kenya, first thing, if I want to sell in retail, labor is very costly. So I need to have a very big setup. Secondly, I need to have a distribution channel. We don't have Blooming Dells here. We don't have Saks Fifth Avenue. So if I produce these products myself, I have to sell them myself. Plus, you also import fabrics? Yes. Okay. For high-end bespoke, we have to import fabrics. For made to measure, we can use fabrics that are available here, depending on. We have different packages and different prices for different, for different suits and, and other products. Okay. So if I want to do a whole setup, and get to that high level in Africa is a bit difficult and it's a bit hard because the cost is very high. Mm -hmm. So for me to get to that setup, and then also we import fabrics, like you said, we import machines. So if, if I'm importing all of these things and the tariff is high, mm -hmm. how much do I need to have that whole setup at the beginning? Then if I'm selling this product myself, I need to, like Vivo, Vivo needs to open all of these shops so that it can sell their own product. No one can store their own products. See, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So. Getting to that level where you can sell in retail is something we're trying to work on, we're trying to, trying to build, but it's, it will take a bit of time. So there's a disconnect because people who are buying, like if I'm selling a high-end suit, the only person who can buy a high-end suit is someone who's earning a certain amount of money. And but, appreciate. And appreciate quality. So that's the problem. So we need to, first thing we need to do marketing, a lot of marketing to get people to understand. Mm -hmm. Then. At the end of the day, we need to create products that can cover all, all ranges. So all right. depending on what uh, purchasing power this person has, you, they can have a product. Because Kenyans don't look at fashion. Mm -hmm. Actually, people appreciate fashion in Kenya, ladies, compared to men. Mm -hmm. Men usually like something functional and something durable. When, when a man comes in and asks you, how long will this fabric last? They're not looking at how good it looks or how, how fancy it looks. How long will it last? Mm. You see, mm. if I'm spending money on this, how long will it last? I don't want to buy this today and then buy something else tomorrow. So they're looking about, I feel like it's looking for value for your money. Yes, it's looking for value for your money. But at the end of the day, if I give you value for that, you, you, you think it's too expensive. Because if I tell you, I, if you want a good quality suit, it will cost you between 600 to $2,000. Mm -hmm. It is too expensive. Yeah. But then, if I'm looking at the cost of bring, just bringing the fabrics into the country, okay. the cost is very high. Now I high. understand. I totally understand. When it comes to mass production, as we've just put it up, mass production and the distribution channel, how can we, like, how can we uh, bridge that? How can the government come, come in in that situation? In that situation now, it, it comes, all, all comes down to having a, a factory here where we can produce our own fabric. Because if you can produce your own fabric, I can order fabrics in mass. If I order fabrics in mass, I can come up with a line. Okay. Then I can sell this line. Because in terms of distribution channels, I think I can open my own shops all over Kenya. Then I can say I'm selling this kind of a product. So if the cost of production is lower, 
anyone can afford to buy this kind of product. So I can have products for the youngest to the oldest. Okay. So if I can, if 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 the tariffs and everything else can come down, then we have a factory here because cotton cotton is here. Mm -hmm. It's being exported, mm -hmm. then sold to us back as fabric. So you see, so in in business, if you are at the top of the food chain, value chain, then you're making money. Mm -hmm. For fabrics, whoever is producing cotton, whoever is producing uh, wool skin, whoever is producing uh, leather, whoever has that in the in in in, in the farm, that's the that's the biggest value chain. Okay. Then when you're going down, because we at the bottom of the value chain. Because we are the end consumer, where we buy fabrics and then make garments and sell. Mm -hmm. If I, if I was getting cotton from here, then it'll be easier for me, because I'll just be getting here. But now I'm getting it from Italy. I'm getting it from London. If I'm importing that fabric, because if you order a suit, it's maybe roughly three meters or four meters. If I'm ordering four meters from London f through DHL, and then I come, I'm, I'm paying. I'm paying for the fabric. I'm paying DHL. Then I'm paying for customs. Before it gets here, mm -hmm. you already you already spend half of what you 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 you're selling the suit for. All right, so a couple of uh, your designs are running on screen right now. A couple of your designs and your projects that you've done. So take us through uh, your ni your niche in the market. Who you get? Who are the guys that you're targeting? Uh, as per now, as a business model we're working on it now, we want to target everyone. But as per now, the people we're targeting are the working class people who wear suits every day. Mm -hmm. That person who wakes up in the morning has to wear a suit to work. A lady or a gentleman, depending on whichever preference they have or job description or environment, that's our target market. We are looking for that gentleman who needs to wear suits every day mm -hmm. and appreciates good quality tailor-made or base box suits. Okay. Yeah. So take us through, if I was to uh, visit uh, Eshoxani Satorial, <laughs> If I was to visit uh, you guys' old location, take us to, uh, if I want a suit, briefly, what are the, the steps that you will take me through? Okay, the first step is really consultation. That's why I get to know you as a person. I get to know what you do, what you like, uh, the kind of fittings that you like, the kind of colors that you usually wear. If you are in a comfort zone, what kind of, what kind of a color will take you out of the comfort zone? Because if I take you out of your comfort zone, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to build from there mm -hmm. as, as your personality. So if I understand your personality and what you do and your character and your, and, and your, your environment that you're in every day, it it's, will be able for me to understand what kind of fabrics you can wear, what kind of an outfit you can wear. And then we can also make come up with new things that you can wear on your day-to-day -day basis. All right. Yeah. All right. So uh, mention for us yeah. the most. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say affordable because I know there's an argument behind that. But <laughs> the most affordable suit and also the most expensive suit. Okay, the most uh, the most affordable. I say affordable. We have different packages. We have packages. Yeah, take us through your packages. Okay, we have our our, our minimum package is fifteen thousand per suit. Okay, that's locally available fabric. It's mm -hmm. really from China, mm -hmm. and then we have the most expensive. Um, it's <laughs> it's from three hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. to seven hundred thousand. That's high end bespoke fabric and a bespoke suit. We have two different types of suits. We have bespoke and made to measure. Okay. Made to measure is your standard suit. You go to a tailor, they take your measurements, and then you do a fitting, and then it's done. Bespoke is more hand stitched. So Literally hand. Yes. So seventy percent of bespoke is done by hand. Okay. Thirty percent is done by machine. So how long does that do, take? Uh, it depends on on how long it takes to get the fabric here. So okay. it can take four to six weeks. All right. And then we do three fittings. Mm -hmm. So uh, seventy percent is done by hand. Then as we, we do the different parts of, we have the back part, front part, the sleeves, the, uh, the, the collar. We bring the bo all of these parts together with a machine, then you do the fitting. Mm -hmm. But when you do the first fitting, it's just a frame of the, of the suit. You just put it on you, then you take it apart, okay. then you do it again. You okay. do the second fitting, it's a long then process. you take it apart. Yeah, oh, it's right. a long process. Okay. And then that's where you get value for your money. Because mm. if I'm selling that suit for you at $1,000, you get value for your money. And then you, peop what people don't know, why bespoke is essential is that most of when you when I look at you I'll, I won't see right now that maybe this this uh, arm is longer than this one this sleeve is longer than this one okay. this leg is longer than this one 
right. usually not balanced. Oh yeah, what trousers are like that? Yeah, you have different, different like half an inch, quarter inch, or one inch difference in terms of your body, your body structure. Okay. So bespoke caters for that. Mm -hmm. For me to measure, we go with the shortest. For bespoke, we balance. So it's more about details yes. and quality. Yeah. All oh, right, that yeah. makes makes lots of sense. Yeah. All right, so how do you guys uh, position yourself in the market and also to increase sales uh, marketing strategy? Well, we have two types of marketing strategies. For for certain packages, for the one from 15,000 to 30,000, we do horizontal marketing. For for the expensive one, we do vertical marketing. Which Talk is to us targeting. about what is the horizontal marketing? Horizontal marketing is where you do mass marketing. Like you use influencers, you use personalities like you. You use uh, musicians to target a certain kind of market. Mm -hmm. Then for vertical marketing, we, we target the person directly. Like mm -hmm. if this is a personality, maybe it's a deputy president, you target him directly, you get a way to reach to him, and then you get a consultation with him where you can show him different fabrics. Because mm -hmm. these are guys who have very expensive suits. Uh, people who are Brioni, Brioni is one of the be most expensive brands in the world where they, they dress presidents, like our president. Mm -hmm. So. To get to these people, you won't, they won't look at uh, a celebrity wearing your suit and say, I like that suit, no. Mm -hmm. They look at quality and fabric and what they can wear, which is functional. So that's why you see them wearing almost the same colors every day. You never see the difference, but the quality of the fabric is different. You see Donald Trump wearing a suit which is worth 2.5 million, but you can't see that. why is it worth 2.5 million. But when you get close to that fabric and you see the texture and the tailoring, you see the difference. Okay. Yeah. And it's also long lasting at the moment. Very long lasting because it's generational. Bespoke is generational where you see a father passing down a jacket to a son. Nice. Yeah, so that, that's bespoke. Sentimental value yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, so for someone who is watching this conversation and they want to get into the design space, fashion design, but again, they're looking at their bank statement, yo, there's no money, capital zero. So how can they go about that? When it comes to designing, don't start a business because you have an idea. Learn. You see, Tom Ford was the CEO of uh, Gucci for almost, I think, 15 years before he started Tom Ford. So. Uh, Sam to Carl Lagerfeld, he was the CEO of, of, of different uh, Coco Chanel, different brands before he became Carl Lagerfeld. So you have to learn before you get into a brand and you want to build your brand. The problem with Kenyans and human beings at the end of the day is patience. People want to make money very fast. If I wanted to make money very fast, I would have done it three, five, four years ago. The reason I take it, I've taken time to learn the process is because if you take your time to build a foundation, it lasts longer. So that next time, if it's my son or whoever comes in next, can get a foundation where they can build from. And that's why our industry, the fashion industry, fails because people who are before us didn't build the foundation. They wanted to make themselves money very fast. Mm -hmm. That's why you see when you go to a fashion so 70% will be Kitenge and Kara <laughs> because everyone is comfortable making Ankara because Ankara sells very fast. This is Africa. So you're saying, you know, we're promoting our own. It's promoting our own, but at the end of the day, innovation is failing. Oh, yeah. Because if, if I don't, I can't wear Ankara to work every day. Makes sense. I need to wear, a, if, if I'm not wearing a suit, I need to wear a very nice shirt, I need to wear a very nice trouser. Mm -hmm. Where can I get that? True. Why don't we have a, a Kenyan who's doing shoes and selling leather shoes? Why? Why do we have to import everything from why do we? Why are we wearing fake Gucci, fake Louis, and you can wear original Ashok Sunny or mm. whoever, whoever designer who is there? Because mm -hmm. that's why I tell you, people celebrate designers, but they don't sell the brand. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So let's look at uh, there's this aspect. Clearly, this space you're into it's lucrative uh, compared to the digits that you've mentioned and how you guys have been, you know, for how long have you been in operation? Seven, eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Eight years. Yeah. So how do you ensure that you're authentic into this space? That's why I said uh, you need to learn and build a foundation. Because when you build a foundation, then everything falls into place. Okay. If, if you're trying to make money very fast, you'll do something that someone else is doing. That's why most of the time you see your designer is doing... You, when you go to Instagram or Pinterest, you see what he's posting is the same as the things on Pinterest. They just, they, even the, sometimes they do the design exactly the way it is. When, when it comes to uh, uh, West African wear, they just do it exactly the way it is and just post it. So w being authentic is just being you, presenting what you feel is yours, whether it's good or bad. If it's good, you'll get feedback. You'll learn from it. If it's bad, you'll know it's bad. Then you'll do better. You won't give up. But 
in terms of staying for longer, being authentic, it's just being who you are. Presenting and selling what you believe is who you are. Because at the end of the day, that's why you see fashion brands having the founder's name. Mm -hmm. You have Gucci, Giorgio Armani, uh, Balmain. The founders are selling an imprint of themselves. So if you accept what I'm selling, then it'll be, it's authentic. And if it's authentic, people will accept it and it'll last longer. Great. Yeah. And looking back, a couple of achievements that you, you looking back, you'll be like, I'm proud I got into this. <laughs> you want me to mention yeah, some you. of the, yes. okay. Uh, the, every day, every day that you, you, you open that door to that business and it's still functional and you have a set of employees who are believing and still working there no matter how good or bad things are, that is an achievement for me every day. I'll be able to open that door and the business is still running. Because we as a business, we have not even achieved 50% of what you're supposed to achieve, mm -hmm. but you're still there and you're still running and you're still, you have people who believe in, because my staff are people who believe in what I want to achieve and they believe in the vision of what we, or where we are going. So we can be making less money now, but in their mind they believe we can make money more as we, as we go forward. Yeah. All right. And how do you build that rapport with your, you, with your employees and just keep the vision going? I, at the end of the day, you know, you, you meet different people, you hire different people, but at the end of the day, when you hire 10 people, you'll find two people mm -hmm. who are believing in what you're saying, who are believing in what you're doing every day, who are believing, who, are, who, are, who believe that the, the road is not very, is very long, the journey is very long. And at the end of the day, when you get those two people, you send the other away, you get another 10, you get two people from there. So you build slowly. That's how I told you it's taken a bit of time. Mm -hmm. We're not even there yet, but we're heading to a certain direction where we believe is the right direction. Fantastic. Yeah. So how do, how do you guys keep afloat during this time of COVID-19, especially uh, during that way, this third way? Yeah, <laughs> it's very, very difficult. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, there's goodwill. At the end of when, 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 when you come to me, you give me your money. Mm -hmm. Tell me, I should do me, make me this comment. I make you this comment, we do adjustments. You're very happy, you're very satisfied. That's good will. And it always comes back, just like karma, it always mm -hmm. comes back. So at the end of the day, whenever it's hard, you channel that good will. Because okay. you have clients who are permanent clients. We have clients who make orders every single month. Mm -hmm. So these are clients who keep you afloat. So whenever it's bad or it's hard, I've Especially last year, I had clients who were calling me and telling me, you guy, are you, are you, are you still open? I tell them, yeah, mm -hmm. but we don't want you to close. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Can I order something? I, I had clients ordering clothes they don't even need. Nice. Because they believe that if you close, they won't have someone later to mm -hmm. take care of what their, their needs are. So it's, it's channeling the goodwill that you have at the end of the day. Yeah, and I also feel like it's good customer relation and yeah. also satisfaction, yeah. good quality at the end of it all. Because what you've been surviving on is, cust is customer loyalty, because at the end of the day, and, 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 and referrals, because if I make you something good, you'll send someone else. We haven't done much. That's why you don't, I'm sure you, you never heard of Ashok Sani before today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm sure because we're not done mass marketing as we're supposed to because we're trying to improve on the quality of the product before we put it into the market. Okay. Then we go to retailing so that when, when you hear Ashok Sani, you know that, that's Ashok Sani who makes this kind of a garment. I can buy this one from. If you need something, you just click Ashok Sani. Okay. So we are getting into that level. All right. Yeah. All, right. All right. So a couple of setbacks that you've experienced uh, for this uh, eight, year, eight years that you've been into business. Like the first time, the first client I had was a wedding because I didn't understand the quality of fabrics. I made a, fa a certain fabric for a certain client. They chose the fabric, but at the end of the day, because you didn't, you, you are still learning, you get the product that doesn't come out very well. You get the, the client who sends back the product. You mm -hmm. have to pay back the full amount. You have a product you can't even use. And then l learning, l the slow process of learning, uh, fabrics, getting good fabrics, COVID, COVID mm. came, COVID is a setback, but it's a learning process at the end of the day. We can never sit around and cry that these are setbacks. You learn from them. That's how you grow. That's true. Yeah. Three financial lessons that you've learned along the way <laughs> as you wind up. <laughs> Put money back into the business as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Don't spend more than the business makes. Mm -hmm. And always, always, always have money in the bank. 
because you never know what comes next. All right. Yeah. Well, good advice there. So, yeah. Master Taylor, how can people find your clothes on social media <laughs> handles? Yes, and if you want the suit, how can we reach out to you? Okay, we are everywhere on social media, Ashok Sani Satorial, mm -hmm. Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook, uh, Twitter, everywhere, Ashok Sani Satorial. Mm -hmm. Our shops, we have one in Moktadada, our workshop, Moktadada Street, a building called Garden Chambers, just next to Jivanji. We have Kilimani Denny Street, Crest Park Apartments. All right, yeah. that is Ashok Sunny. Yeah. All right, thank you very much for creating time thank to have this conversation uh, with us when it comes to fashion redefined yeah. Yeah. and also fashion industry in general. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. So, guys, that is uh, uh, the Master Taylor, <laughs> known as Ashok Sunny. So, make sure you follow them across all the social media handles and keep the conversation going. Remember, at Y254 channel is where you can find us across all our social media handles. At Michelle Ashira is where you can find me across all my social will be right back.